We are here today with Margaret Atwood, celebrated Canadian author, poet, uh, activist. And so I first wanted to ask you about the reason that you're here today, the Great World Text event. So this great text for this year is The Tempest, played by Shakespeare. And from what I saw of the presentations, they have really gone into the play in considerable depth and detail, and they've all thought about it quite a lot. What The Tempest is, uh, it's the closest Shakespeare ever gets to uh, writing about what he himself actually did as a director, producer, actor, manager. So Prospero is, is in essence, a theater director. Um, I mean, you're certainly having a moment now with uh, the, the rise in popularity again of your classic book, The Handmaid's Tale. It and is certainly a moment. Did you kind of see it coming with, you know, the 2016 election? Even during the last two elections, it was already a, a meme. The um, civil rights that people have um, worked for and fought for for really quite a long period of time, once they've been achieved, we, t we tend to think that's that, you know, done, uh, we can move on and do something else now. But that's never true. Democracy is always pretty fragile. And you could all, almost make a little dictatograph, like a clock with the dictatorship up at the top, anarchy down at the bottom, and the sweet spot across the middle, which is where you actually want to be. So if things get too close to anarchy, people are willing to trade their civil rights and legal entitlements for more safety. And then you get a dictatorship. Uh, so often, people bent on having a dictatorship foster anarchy. You know, they actually like civil conflict because it gives them a chance to say, me, strong leader, uh, and all you have to do is sign here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I published the book in 1985, uh, some people took the it could never happen here view, but I've, I've never taken that view. Anything can happen anywhere given the circumstances because Again, back to Shakespeare, human nature, um, that's what we're like. If we're too threatened by anarchy, we will choose um, authoritarianism. I don't think it will be easy to get America to, to roll over for a totalitarianism. And I also don't think the, that, although people feel somewhat threatened by this and that, they don't feel so threatened that they're going to roll over easily and say, oh right, here's, here's our civil rights, just, mm -hmm. you know, bring stability. And I don't see any stability being brought right now anyway. One thing that you really need for stability is a reasonable amount of, of income equality. Mm -hmm. And to make things more unequal, which is what this administration <laughs> seems to be proposing, as well as doing away with, with health care for really millions of people, uh, that's not going to bring more stability. Mm -hmm. It's going to bring more unrest. I was also curious, while we're talking about The Handmaid's Tale, um, the upcoming Netflix um, series. We're and Netflix. Oh, I'm sorry, Hulu. Hulu and MGM are making the yes, that's right. uh, series. And indeed, they've shot it. Uh, and I've seen the first three and a half episodes. It's very strong. Um, it's pretty shocking, and it goes further than the book did. And, some directions. Really? You mean visually wise with that attitude? Narratively oh, wise. Okay. Visually it looks great, but it because it's a television series, it can follow the lives of some of the characters mm -hmm. who simply disappear from view in the novel because our main character can't know what has happened to them. But we, as the audience, can in the Hulu series. So were you involved at all with um, kind of developing some of those other narratives? My position, I get called some sort of executive producer, which is like a honorary degree <laughs> <laughs> title, but it doesn't actually mean you have any control. Mm -hmm. However, because they're very respectful towards the work, they're obviously not going to do anything that's so far out of line that it's, that it's, not, uh, that it's not consonant with the, with the book. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about speculative fiction and things that have been done, you know, future projections that you're envisioning that kind of go beyond what you have even considered would be possible? Nobody can predict the future because there's too many wild cards. And technological and biotechnological progress is so rapid 
that something that you might have thought three years ago was not possible suddenly becomes possible. So CRISPR, the gene splicing method, has now made a lot of things really very possible that were people would have said they were fantasy. In fact, people did say they were fantasy ten years ago. With, with all of these things that happened, there's what you think will happen, and then there are other things that, that, that do happen as side effects that you haven't been thinking about because they've been off your radar. So I would say we're on a, we're on a road, but that's not necessarily the road that we're going to stay on. Um, the most important issue facing us right now is what's happening to the planet. Because without the planet, that's kind of the end of us. That's really the most important question, is what we're doing to the oceans going to cut off our oxygen supply. Um, I haven't written that book because the end wouldn't be... <laughs> it's too scary to think about. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> before the oxygen supply completely vanishes, it will diminish, and then we're all going to be as stupid as if we were on top of Mount Everest without an oxygen tank. We're going to get stupider before we get dead. And let us hope that with the aid of CRISPR, you can develop a more resilient blue-green algae that will resist the effects of acidification of the ocean, warming of the ocean, and all the plastic we're dumping into it. Um, well, and I definitely did want to ask about climate change, and especially um, you know, the Mad Adam trilogy that you wrote, um, maybe not as well known as The Handmaid's Tale, but certainly dealing with very tangential related themes of the, the change of everything in our changing world. Certainly last week we saw a rollback of EPA regulations. Well, they, luckily states and cities are resisting yeah. some of this. Yeah, are you heartened by some of the, the pushback? And Well, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's the pushback. There's also um, certain kinds of biotechnological progress and inventions that um, will mitigate some of this. And if you ask any one individual, say, I ask you, if you could have... Uh, a car of a reasonable price that was completely off the grid and made its own energy from solar, would you have one? Who would say no? Nobody says no. And the other thing they don't say no to is if you could have your house running on an off the grid energy supply, such as Mr. Musk's power wall, uh, at a reasonable price, would you do it? Nobody says no. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask about uh, the feminist movement and kind of the modern iteration of that. Okay, so that it's, it's not singular, it's plural. The feminisms, absolutely. Yeah, different kinds of feminisms. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's never been true that, that you could speak for all w women in one paragraph because 53% of white women voted for the Trump administration and you can't get around that. So maybe the thing to do is instead of just dismissing all those people, is to say, okay, what was your main concern? You know, what's your biggest worry? And quite frequently people vote their families. They vote what they think is going to be good for their family. And that means job, um, some sort of future for their kids, and um, not so much them, you know, not so much themselves. I think some, some of the mistakes that people make is uh, dismissing other people who have different points of view and in the environmental movement, it's a, there's a big difference between going to a country and saying, all of this area of yours should be a game park and kick the people out. You know, why is that good? Uh, or going and saying, okay, here's the people, here's their situation, why don't we ask them what could make things better for them? What would be better for them? Not your idea of them, but them. Well, and speaking of communication, um, I just started following you on Twitter. Have you um, always been? No. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get involved? Okay, I got involved after the uh, 2008 crash, okay. which caused publishers to go spinning around, tearing out their hair and, and downsizing. And I had a book coming out in 2009, and I thought, I think I better build a website for myself, for this book, and I'm going to launch it in, a, in an unusual way. And I launched it via a series of 
um, dramatic and musical book launch performances, uh, which I then blogged and tweeted via the website. It was in a younger stage at that point, and I think somewhat more benevolent than parts of Twitter have since become. So I think the first people onto it were, were younger people. And then I think the Obama campaign um, used it to some effect, used social media to some effect, and then the, and then the Republicans caught up with it. I think they were behind the times for a couple of years there. And now we have, of course, the phenomenon of, of uh, Russia putting out fake news and, um, and having infiltrated the entire system. And I think that's why there's been a swing back to more traditional media, because you don't know anymore. Well, people say things on it that they would never ever say to your face. Exactly. Not in a million years. Oh, yeah. They think they have anonymity. Mm -hmm. It releases something. That well, it's sort of like it. the old form of it used to be writing naughty things on washroom walls. <laughs> now it's there for all the world to see. <laughs> it is, but people don't Girl. quite get that. Kind of looking ahead, you know, future communication methods, I was very curious to know about your future library project. And I know you can't reveal what the book is about, but what do you, I mean, could you give us a hint or? Oh, okay, so it's a, an artist called Katie Patterson, who is Scottish. Um, and a lot of her projects have to do with time. Mm -hmm. And she met up with a person from Norway and they cooked up this future library Norway project involving a hundred years of time. Mm -hmm. And Katie says that she was inspired by tree rings, which measured the growth of a tree, measured the years of a tree, and the idea that leaves of a tree and leaves of paper are the same word, and she imagined the words coming up and out in the form of leaves, and then paper is made of trees, so that was her thinking. So she has a mind like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they cooked up Future Library in which they would ask a um, hundred authors, one at a time, over the hundred years, to submit a manuscript um, in a box that nobody else got to look into. Two copies, archival paper, um, I added that, <laughs> two um, digital copies, which they will have to recopy every few years because technology changes. Mm -hmm and no other, no other copies. Words only, no images, and you're not allowed to tell anybody what you have put in. And those will sit there until a hundred years have passed, and then all of the boxes will be opened, and enough trees will be cut from the forest that they planted in 2014 to make the paper for the future library anthology. And just in case, She's putting a printing press into the future library room. So you'll be able to go into this room and see the titles and the authors of all of these books, or whatever they are. It, it aroused a lot of interest around the globe. They got a huge amount of press on it because it's a hopeful project. Mm -hmm. It assumes there will be people, they will be reading, there will be a library, uh, that the books will last, and that in that year they will indeed appear. Well, and what are you working on now? I never tell. You never tell? Uh-oh. Well, wonderful. I think that's probably our time. Um, was there anything else that I didn't ask you about that you've been dying to say in an interview? No. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much.